Well, good morning. We're glad to see each one here today for a uh, special service as we are going to uh, take our morning worship service and also apply it to uh, remembering uh, our sister in the Lord, Carol Merritt, who has gone on to be with her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we will be uh, having a normal worship service with an emphasis upon uh, encouraging Bob, encouraging one another uh, concerning the Word of God and uh, what God says when one who has believed in Christ uh, leaves uh, is behind and goes on to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wanted to read uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, as we come to the service this morning, uh, we want to be turning to the Word of God, where we find the, the great hope for all of us who know Christ concerning death and the resurrection and eternal life. So we will look to the Word of God this morning. Also, as we sing uh, the songs, we do so. Uh, for the purpose of glorifying Christ, but we're also singing to one another the truth that's contained within them from the Word of God. Uh, again, to encourage Bob, but also to consider uh, each other as we think about what God has promised concerning death and the resurrection and eternal life. So keep that in mind this morning as we uh, enter into our worship service, and I trust that it will be a real blessing not only to Bob, but to every one of us who knows Christ uh, as their Savior. And a few announcements I will share with you today. Um, keep in mind the preschool, be in prayer for that. There's the mailing going out as we're offering preschool free this year, which would be two days a week and also the option for Sunday morning, uh, which is an outreach opportunity. So please be in pray, prayer for the preschool. Also today, there is uh, those who knew uh, the lollies. There's a uh, get-together upstairs at 1 o'clock uh, to be aware of. And then next Sunday, we have our church picnic of the month. Uh, we've had that each month this summer. And next Sunday, the service will be inside, and then the picnic will be in the back. Uh, we're keeping the idea of staying cool in mind. So hopefully that will work for everyone. But we've had some wonderful times of fellowship with the picnics after church. And there's a sign-up sheet in the back if you would like to contribute a food item uh, for that picnic. And also there is a announcement concerning choir. Choir will be starting up again. And we'll be meeting for the first time on Wednesday, September 8th. And they are looking for men, women, uh, to be a part of it, and if you have questions and are interested, please see how about the choir. I believe the rest of the announcements you can take note of in the bulletin, but keeping in mind, uh, we're looking at today the great hope of the resurrection, the promises that we have from Jesus Christ concerning his work on our behalf uh, that guarantees us eternal life. So at this time, we'll have the prelude. And as uh, Allison plays, uh, we want to encourage you to begin to prepare your hearts uh, to worship Christ together.
Let's join our hearts together in prayer and ask God's blessing upon our service. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with the great hope that we have been given in Jesus Christ. And Lord, today as we consider the promises of God to all those who have believed in Jesus Christ, believed in his work on our behalf and his shed blood on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, meaning that because he lives, we too shall live. Lord, I pray that every believer here today would be encouraged, strengthened in their faith, and ready to uh, consider the aspect of what it means to leave this earth and go into the presence of the Lord if Christ tarries his coming. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen believers here today. And we especially pray for Bob that you would comfort him, that the peace of Christ would rule in his heart, uh, with that understanding that his wife is absent from the body, but now is present with the Lord. And we thank you for saving Carol. We thank you for her testimony, uh, the time that we have shared with her. And Lord, I pray that uh, the reality of where she is, what she is enjoying, the love of Christ shown to her even now, Lord, may that encourage Bob and encourage everyone here today. And Lord, we do thank you for Christ, the difference that he makes, and we pray now that as we enter into this service with songs of praise, with looking at the word of God, that in all things Jesus Christ would be exalted, and that you would use this time uh, together to glorify him above all things and to grow us in our faith. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Christ alone, there is no fear of death. There's only that blessed assurance that is found in knowing Jesus Christ as one's Lord and Savior. And certainly, uh, Carol had that assurance, and Bob has that assurance even now uh, that she's with the Lord. And this past week, uh, asking Bob uh, about a message, I said, what do you think of the account of Lazarus for the message? I wasn't too sure, and I wanted to make sure that would be appropriate for him. And he said that would be the best thing, because Carol and I have several verses that are our favorites in that passage. And I said, well, praise the Lord, that's what we'll look at today. Uh, the resurrection of Lazarus and the power of that is found in that passage of scripture uh, for all believers as you consider death, you consider what happens to someone when they die. And I would even encourage you as you prepare for that day, if Christ tarries his coming, that now is the time to prepare. Know the promises of God, know what God has to say to you, uh, so that when that moment comes that you're, you're ready to go with the faith that God gives to all who believe. And today for our scripture reading, we want to look at John chapter 11, uh, verses 38 to 44. In John 11, 38, here's the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead recorded. It says, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. Now this is an incredible miracle by the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the resurrection of the dead man, Lazarus. And we'll look at this in a few moments to see even further uh, what this should mean uh, to all the followers of Jesus Christ and the hope that is found in it.
as we think of those words to the songs that we have just sung. Uh, it's wonderful to think that Bob, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Uh, that's our hope. Wonder of, the wonder of it all, that was one of Carol's favorite songs. And you stop and think of the words of that, be his love for her, the wonder of that. But to think now how she understands that in far greater way now that she's in the presence of Christ. Uh, that's, that's where our minds, that's where our hearts need to go. Uh, this is what God has promised. This is what God is doing for those who have believed in him. And we want to encourage one another uh, in the word of God, in the truth concerning Jesus Christ and what he has done for all who have believed in him because of his work on the cross and because of his resurrection. And today we want to look at John chapter 11, the hope of the resurrection. And as we enter into this passage of scripture, let me encourage everyone here today uh, to consider those that you have loved, who have gone on to be with the Lord, to consider one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and how we encourage one another during this time with the word of God. And we want to do this in a way to honor the life of Carol, who had trusted in Christ as her Savior, who loved the Lord, who loved people, loved her husband for 50 years. Uh, they had a wonderful marriage and relationship that was a testimony to all of us to see the love that they had for one another. And certainly we want to honor uh, her testimony, her life. We also want to encourage one another. We want to encourage Bob in the truth of Scripture, the promises of God. We also want to encourage one another because if Christ tarries his coming, we all will face that moment, that timing that God has planned for us when he brings us to be with him in glory. And it has been said that that is the greatest test of faith for the believer. Uh, that moment when you face death and you're ready to pass from this life into the next, we don't get to practice that. Uh, you get one shot. Uh, and we need to be ready with the faith that God gives when we cling to the promises of God found in Christ. So we want to encourage Bob and one another in this great hope. Above all, we want to glorify Jesus Christ. Uh, we want to glorify his plan of salvation that Carol realized by the grace of God. The plan of salvation that we have experienced for those who have been born again by the grace of God that we give all the glory to Jesus Christ for this great hope. We give all the glory for Jesus Christ for that blessed assurance, the wonder of his love shown to us as undeserving sinners. Uh, we want to glorify God, Jesus Christ, uh, in moments like this. And then also I know Carol would desire that if there is anyone who does not have that hope of Christ, who has never trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today you might consider what God has offered through his Son, Jesus Christ, as the only plan of salvation that guarantees, that gives that hope, that if you trust in Jesus, you can be assured that you have eternal life, nothing to fear in death. And in John chapter 11, this is a longer passage, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the account and give thoughts concerning sections of this that relate to the promises of God, how we should be thinking, what God desires that we believe in relationship to death and to resurrection. So there's a lot here but we're going to bring out some general truths to encourage Bob, to encourage one another concerning uh, what happens to us, what happens to our loved ones when they pass into the presence of Jesus Christ. So verses 1 to 3, we see the death of, G of Lazarus beginning to unfold. It says, Now a certain man was sick, sick Lazarus of Bethany, 
the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he, he whom you love is sick. Uh, all of us in life face sicknesses. All of us will face death. And one of the things that we can take from this is to think of family, think of loved ones who have known illness, who have known death, who have known the Lord. And one of the key points that you can see here is that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved this family. They were his disciples. And what we always want to keep in mind whenever we're facing illness, whether it leads to death or not, when we face death, which is a difficult, it's an ugly thing, it's an enemy. Bible describes it as an enemy. In those moments, we always want to remember that Jesus loves us. Jesus loved Carol even in the midst of the incident of her passing into eternity. That never changed. Jesus loves Bob. That never changes. Jesus loves his own in sickness and in death, and it never changes. And that is a truth to cling to, to believe in, and never forget. Because many times in those moments, we begin to think, where's God? Has he left us? Has he forgotten us? Why would he allow this to happen? Which is a normal question. But we must remember, Jesus' love never forsakes his own. Romans mentions that says, what can separate one of God's own from the love of Christ? And it goes through a whole list. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, and it mentions even death. Not even death can separate us from the love of God. And we see verses 4 to 6, the response of Jesus to that news that Lazarus was very sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. What would you have expected Jesus to do when he heard that someone that he loved was sick? Well, the expectation would be he would hurry, go, and heal him from that illness. But what we see here unfolding is that God had another plan. And God's plan centers upon God does everything in the best interest of those that he loves, and he does everything to bring glory to himself. And so Jesus here, what he is doing, he is stating in a sense, well, I'm going to wait because what I'm going to be doing is going to show love to that family and all who would see that miracle, and it's going to glorify God. And when you think of the point that could be made here and applied is that in death, those loved ones who've known the Lord, who've gone on before us, who are now in the presence of God, however those situations unfolded, did God have a plan? He did. Was his timing right? It was. Would it glorify himself? It would. Do we always see how it glorifies him? Well, maybe not in the moment, but someday we'll see it literally. But we must believe that everything that God does is to his glory, including the timing of when he brings home uh, his own. And as we see that, we also see it's not only glorifying to God, but he's loving that person through it all. Why was God's timing for Carol the way it was? We may not know, but we know what. God glorifies himself in it, and God's love to Carol continues now in ways that she's experiencing that we can only imagine. 
And this is what we must believe. And as Jesus was looking to the future with Lazarus, he's already planning what's going to unfold will glorify God. And I'm going to show love to this family. And then we also see the decision, verse 7 through 11, to go to Lazarus. Then after he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. As you see this statement by Jesus, the disciples say to him, You want to go back to Judea? That's where they just tried to kill you. They were going to stone you to death. Maybe it's better that you not go. But what does Jesus say? Well, I'm going. There's nothing that will stop me. Nothing stops the purposes of God. And again, what we see here is this. The love of Jesus Christ shown to Lazarus and his family, nothing would get in the way. If he so desired, if it was God's will as it was for him to go, they were not going to kill him at this time. He would see to it that the will of God was fulfilled. And the same thing is true in our everyday lives up until the point of death and even beyond. Nothing stops the love of God being shown to his people. Uh, the mercy of God, the love of God, you can't measure it. And nothing keeps that love from us. And for Bob to continue forward remembering the love of God was shown to him and it will continue to be shown to him. The love of God is shown to every single person each and every day who knows Jesus Christ and nothing can stop it. Not death, not the circumstances of the world, not illness, nothing stops the love of God being shown to his own. So Jesus has said, it's time to go. We're heading to see Mar Mary and Martha and to perform a miracle with Lazarus who has passed away. In verses 12 through 16, you see the revealing of Lazarus' death to disciples. He said to his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. What were the disciples thinking? Jesus said he's sleeping. Therefore, maybe he'll get better because he'll get some rest. Well, Jesus has a whole different idea in mind. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. No, the disciples did not understand that term Jesus used for Lazarus' death, sleeping. But as you think about the application to us today, we also find in the word of God that the New Testament speaks about the believer that when they die... The Bible calls it sleep. And what does that mean? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, here is the idea of the resurrection, the idea of what happens to a believer when they die. It says, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So the biblical idea of sleeping for those who have died is this. They leave the body behind and the body is at rest. It's sleeping. But the inner person, the spirit, the soul, has been ushered into the presence of Christ awaiting for the resurrection. And that is the promise of God that is the truth that every believer clings to and should hold to, 
that when you see a loved one who knows the Lord pass away, you're actually able to celebrate they're not here. They're with Christ. Yes, we can witness a body. Yes, that has to be placed in the tomb. There are those things that are done. But that person is no longer in that body. When you get ready to face death in your own life, here's a verse you want to hold to, cling to. I'm going to be absent from the body, but present with my Lord. God's going to take me from this body, bring me into the presence of Christ, where I will await the resurrection day for the glorified body. But this is how the Bible speaks and encourages the believer today, that the body is at rest, it's sleeping, but the person is with the Lord. Praise God for that truth. And we know that Carol is absent from the body, but present with the Lord. Praise God for what Christ has done for her. And then verses 17 to 22, as Jesus goes, he's going to meet up with Martha, the sister of Lazarus. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now it's interesting, you can look into the reason for four days. The Jews had a superstition that... Three days after death, there was the possibility of that person being resuscitated, coming back. So God's making something very clear to all the Jews who would witness and hear about this resurrection. It was four days. There was no possibility uh, based upon some of the Jewish beliefs and superstitions that she could be, uh, he could be brought back. And so when he came to the tomb, it was four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. When you see the meeting with Martha, what is she thinking? Lord, if you'd come sooner, you could have healed him from his illness. Why were you waiting? At the same time, she's saying what? I still believe. I believe in you. I am going to continue to believe in you. But why did you wait? Why couldn't this have been worked out in a different way? Now, when you think of that, what's the application? Well, as you think about loved ones who have passed away, isn't it always normal to ask God why? Why now? Why this way? Why did this have to happen? God doesn't say don't ask that question. God doesn't say don't come into my presence through prayer and pour out your heart and, and say, Lord, this isn't what I would have wished. There's no problem with asking and expressing that sorrow, that hurt, that question. But what needs to be there alongside of it and actually overruling is that, Lord, whatever you have determined, I still believe in you and I trust in your timing and in your ways and I bow my knee before you and trust that you have done what glorifies you and what shows love to me and to my loved one. And so as you see this reaction by Martha, it's typical, it's normal. And it's also encouraging because she's doing what? She said, I still believe. And you can do whatever you desire to do, and I submit to that. And then Jesus, the declaration of Jesus... In 23 to 27, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day, which is true. She believed that he would be resurrected as all the saints of God would be. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Here's the statement by Jesus Christ where he declares, I am God. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Everyone who believes in me can count on a resurrected, glorified body brought into eternity in heaven with Christ. All it takes is belief, belief that Jesus is God, belief that Jesus died for your sins, belief that he rose again, and belief that he is the, has the power over the resurrection. And it's wonderful news for Martha, for Mary, now they don't know what's about to happen, uh, to demonstrate that power, but certainly we see this very important truth proclaimed by Jesus. And remember what he said to his disciples? I'm going to go, and what I'm about to do is going to glorify God and show love to all who witness what is about to happen. And here is the love of God shown in Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. And if you have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Again, here's truth to cling to. Jesus is God. He is the one who can resurrect the dead without any problem whatsoever. He called everything into existence through the power of his word, and he can resurrect the dead without any issues whatsoever because he is God. And he's the life. What is the life? Well, that's spiritual life, eternal life. It's a quality of life. It's found in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, as he encourages Martha, as he encourages us today through the power of his word, we want to always remember we are following, we are committed to, we have believed in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. It's not found anywhere else. It's only found in Jesus. And then you also have the meeting with Mary that follows. Verse 28, when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, the typical thinking that falls upon anyone who loses a loved one. Uh, why now? Why this way? And in this case, you could have come and you could have healed him, but what do we see with Mary? She fell to her knees. She's still honoring Jesus Christ. She's not going to stop believing in him. She just needs that hope, that assurance that comes from Christ about her brother and what God was doing. And the same thing continues to be true for us. We always have the sorrow that accompanies the loss of a loved one. Now, the Bible speaks of that. We sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. So it is expected by God. It is normal for us to have the pain, to have the tears, to have the suffering when we lose a loved one. God says that's normal. But what trumps that, what brings us through that, is the peace that passes all understanding that they are with the Lord. What overcomes that sorrow and rules over it is the promise of God that they are no longer with us, but they're with Christ in heaven. You know, if you've lost a loved one, when those moments of sorrow hit you, that's the time to remember where they're, where they're at, what Jesus has done for them, and that someday you'll see them again. You know, as you lose a loved one, there's different things that will trigger memories of them. You'll hear a song. You'll see someone you haven't seen for some time, and there was a connection there. Uh, 
different things will come upon you. And if they're with the Lord, that sorrow may sting for a moment, but then you turn and say, wow, they're with Jesus. They're seeing things we're only imagining right now, and we hope to see someday. But they have no more cares, no more pain, no more sorrow. They're not up in heaven wishing, boy, I wish I could go back to earth. Uh, they're happy where they're at. And someday we will join them. And Lord willing, we'll join them through the coming of Jesus Christ. If not, then he has a way that he's going to bring us to that point of death and usher us into the kingdom of heaven. And it's interesting, the Bible talks about there's rejoicing in heaven when God brings home his saints through death. Uh, there is glory being given to Jesus Christ, to God, when another person enters into the presence of Christ. And we want to remember those things when those moments hit us with that sorrow. And so here's Mary. She's just lost her brother. The sorrow is striking her heart heavy. And yet, what is she doing? She's at the feet of Jesus looking for the help that she needs to get through it. And then we come to the resurrection of Lazarus. As it begins to unfold... In verse 33, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Now, this is an interesting account of what Jesus experienced as he heard and as he saw Mary and Martha, their sorrow. It says he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. It actually means he was angry in a righteous way. He was upset in an angry way that death was causing those that he loved to suffer. Uh, he did not like it. He understood it. And so when you see this battle with death, and death is called an enemy in the Bible, but we know what? Jesus Christ has conquered death for all who believe in him. That death is not something to fear. Death is not something that will win the day. Jesus Christ has already won the day for us over death. But it troubled him to see Mary crying. It troubled him to see Martha hurting because of the sorrow they experienced because of the death of Lazarus. And as you think of that, again, what's the application? Well, Jesus has conquered death. We know that. We believe it. We must cling to that. But he also understands our hurt when we lose a loved one. And he understands it better than any other person because he's God. And then as he sees this, the battle with death, it's also interesting when you keep the timing of this in mind. He's going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. But as you look forward, when it comes to defeating death, when Jesus Christ goes to the cross and he lays down his life for his own and he sheds his blood, he is paying the price for our sin. And when he resurrects from the grave, it is a clear defeat of death. And it allows now those who have believed in God, believed in Christ, to now enter into the presence of Christ, God, in heaven. Prior to the death of Christ, the Old Testament saints, like Lazarus would have been, they would have been in a waiting place because their sins were not taken care of by Christ on the cross yet. They were waiting for that moment. But now we know in the New Testament that it's instant that, that we die, we go into the presence of Christ because... He paid the penalty for our sin. He made it possible for us to be in the presence of a holy God. And so that battle with death, Jesus Christ is the one who has defeated death. And then the love for his disciples clearly seen, verse 35. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man alive? 
know, the shortest verse in the Bible is right there. Jesus wept. You stop and you think, what was occurring? Here's God in the flesh, fully God, fully man. He sees the pain, he feels the pain, and he cries. And the weeping here, there's different uh, usage of words in the New Testament to describe crying or weeping. In this sense, what it's showing is that it was almost a silent crying, weeping, private, in a sense, because he was grieving. And so he's grieving for Mary and Martha. And again, Bob, you think Jesus knows all about it, uh, knows all about where you're at. And I don't know in a sense he probably weeps even at this moment, grieves for you, but he's right there with you for every step of the way into the future. Jesus loves his own and never never leaves us, forsakes us, never doesn't know well, what's happening in this person's life. He's right there. He knows every aspect of what's occurring, and he will meet your needs. And so you see that love for his disciples, and then you see the resurrection. And the purpose of this resurrection was stated by Jesus earlier. He said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to bring Lazarus back from the dead, resurrect his body so that people will believe that they will see that I am who I say that I am, that I am God, that I am the promised Messiah, that I am the one who will give resurrection life and eternal life to all who will believe. He's going to perform this miracle for that purpose. And it unfolds beginning in verse 38. Then Jesus... <clears throat> Again, groaning in himself. Again, that's the idea that as he's dealing with death, uh, he hates death. He hates the impact of it. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Now, logical thinking, right? Now, what are, what are we doing here? That's my brother. There's going to be, this would be an awkward situation. Uh, the King James Version, what he stinketh, you know. Uh, this is the occurrence of what happens to a body. And yet Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. You know, can you imagine that? <clears throat> you try to picture that occurring. Here's this account. You know, they put their dead into the tombs, the caves. They had wrapped them in cloth. And then Jesus says, take away the stone. And then he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, that must have been a very silent moment following that, as people's eyes would have been fixed on that tomb. And it says, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Jesus Christ resurrected the dead. Now today you get a lot of, uh, I don't know what to call them, charlatans, fakes, who will say they've resurrected people from the dead. Uh, as soon as I hear that, what my thought is, is nope, <laughs> doesn't happen. God's not performing miracles of that kind today. Run from that type of person when they declare they've done that. But here's Jesus. Here's God in the flesh, and he's demonstrating to all that would see this that he is God and he can resurrect the dead. No one else can do that but God. We have the record of it now in the Bible that calls people today, you and I, to believe in Jesus Christ. He's resurrected the dead. He's the resurrection and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. 
Therefore, believe in Jesus Christ, and you can have that assurance that you too will be experiencing the resurrection of the body from the grave, and that you too can have that hope of eternal life, that hope that Carol had, the hope that many of us have had because of Jesus Christ. And so that's the purpose of it. And then verses 45 through the end of the chapter explains how people responded to that miracle. Verse 45, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, they believed in him. God used that circumstance to bring glory to himself and to show love to Mary and Martha and Lazarus and also to show love to those who would believe in him. They believed that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, that he was God and the source of eternal life. However, there's other responses as well. And to me, this is always amazing, as I'm sure it is to many of you who know the Lord. Those who can see the truth, hear the truth, and yet continue to reject it. And what we see here following in verses 46 and was, But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Why? Because they didn't believe. And so they would go, they would share with the Pharisees that, that what Jesus had done. Verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. They still would not believe, even though they had witnessed a miracle that clearly showed that Jesus was God. That clearly showed that he was who he said he was. And yet they continued in their total depravity. They continued in their blindness to the truth. And they plotted to kill Jesus. Why? Well, if you read the rest of that passage, because their power was threatened. Their group of followers was threatened. Therefore, they wanted to have nothing to do with Jesus. They wanted to put him to death. And this is where we would state, if you have known Christ as your Savior... It's by the grace of God that he's opened your eyes to the truth of who Jesus is, led you to put your faith in him and him alone, and you can have that hope that he gave to Mary, to Martha, and to Lazarus, that because he's died, because he lives, because of his power, that we have the victory over death. You know, the Bible says, for those who have believed in Christ, no, oh, death, where is your sting? There's no victory there. Even when we see a loved one pass away, we can say what? Uh, death has not won the day. Christ has won the day, and we praise God for it. But it also would be an encouragement to anyone here today who has never trusted in Christ as their Savior and Lord to see Jesus for who he is. He is the eternal God who came into this world and became a man so that he could go to the cross, lay down his life for sinners, rise again, so that now all who believe in him have their sins cared for before a holy, righteous God, and now we can be ushered into the presence of God because Christ cared for our sins. And Christ rose again, Therefore, because he lives, we too shall live. That's the power of the gospel. That's the message of the gospel for all who would believe to look at the responses to the work of Jesus. How have you responded? We know that Carol had trusted in Christ as her Savior. We know that her life that she lived reflected that change that God brought to her life. And so therefore we know what? She's present with the Lord waiting that resurrection day. And that would be our desire, her desire for anyone who has never trusted in Christ. Take a look at who Jesus is. Take a look at what he declares and believe in Jesus Christ. And you too can know that hope of the resurrection. Father in heaven, we thank you for Christ. 
We thank you for the difference that he makes in our lives, even when we face these moments of death. And Lord, I pray for every believer here today that you would comfort their hearts, that you would strengthen their faith, that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that to leave this body, to leave this world, is to be present with Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray for Bob that you would continue to reassure his heart and mind that there is the sorrow and the loss of his beloved wife, but there's also the love of God that has brought her home to be with Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you for that work that once again glorifies God and shows love to those who have experienced this loss. And Lord, we would continue to ask that you would open the hearts and minds of anyone who has not believed, that today might even be a day of salvation for them, that they might know what it means to be one of God's own, to never have to fear death, but to have that resurrection hope and that eternal life granted through belief in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And again, we just thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.